Hello, let's quickly recap the dynamics contents of week number seven, this time for real, week number seven. What we did was we talked about rigid bodies. And remember that there's always three principles we have at our disposal, which are LMB, AMB, and the work energy balance, which some people in class like to abbreviate as the WAB, work energy balance. And these we have now for rigid bodies. And we talked about all the intricacies. This is F equals MA. This one is the change in angular momentum equals the net torque being applied. And we saw that we have to always choose as a reference point either the center of mass or a point of zero velocity. And this one is pretty much what we've been doing the whole time with the one exception that in the kinetic energy, we need to consider both translations and rotations. And we should take reference point, which is either the center of mass or not moving again. And we can apply these three principles. And I'm not going to reiterate all of this here, even though, of course, we will need them again with number seven and eight and so forth. What's new with this week is that we talked about rigid body collisions. And in particular, what we've seen for collisions is that the general scenario is now that we have two rigid bodies, one over here and another one over here. And these two have different masses, they have different sizes and different shapes. We generally assume that these are convex bodies and that at some point they're hitting each other. And this over here we call point S1 and this point S2. And of course, when they're coming together, these two points will eventually be the same, right? The bodies are hitting each other right here. And when they hit each other, they will be exchanging a impulsive force or a force, which we call P or integrated over time, P hat. So we have P hat here. That also means we will have an impulsive force, a minus P hat acting on the other body. And the key point for a collision is that there are no other external forces acting on this system of two rigid bodies. So there's no net change, no net external force being applied. Linear momentum is conserved. And the exchange between the two is P here minus P there. And these interaction for, uh, points, S1 and S2, are no longer the centers of mass like for particles. For a particle, it was simple because it was just a point. Here, this body has a certain size, and therefore the contact points are, of course, not in general the same as the centers of mass. What we have seen is that we can come up with an integrated version of LMB, and we'll like this, which is exactly the same as what we've seen for uh, particles, namely, the linear momentum, for example, for body one, let's say this has a mass m1 and this m2. After the collision, which is m1 times the velocity of body one, and in this case, it's the center of mass of body one. So this is linear momentum after the collision, minus linear momentum before the collision, I can factor out m1, v of the center of mass of body one before the collision, equals, and the change in linear momentum is the impulsive force being applied, which in this case is nothing else but p hat. So it would look something like this. This is the same as for particles, except that we need the velocities of the centers of mass here, because f equals ma for rigid bodies applies to the center of mass. And then, of course, we can do the same thing also for body number two, in which case this would become a two, right? This would be a two, this would be a two, and the only other thing that changes is that body 2 is not being hit by p, but by minus p. And so we have two equations for the two bodies acting here, or uh, colliding here. And then what we have in addition, and this is new, because for particles it made no sense, but for rigid bodies we do have to consider it. Namely, we also have a change in angular momentum, and this change in angular momentum I can write as the angular momentum afterwards, which is I, for example, with respect to the center of mass, let's say of body one, times the angular velocity afterwards, body one, minus ICM one times omega one before the collision. And this is what? Well, this is a change in angular momentum, so this must equal the impulsive torque being applied. And the torque of this point, uh, of this force P hat, of this body is nothing else but lever arm cross force. So this would be the vector which goes from the center of mass of body one to point S1 cross P hat, right? This is the net torque applied by force P hat. This is the lever arm. And so R cross P is nothing else but the net torque being applied by this impulsive force P. And this results in a change in angular velocity or angular momentum of this body one. And of course, we can again do the same for body two, in which case it would become a two. Oops. This over here, which pen did I use before? I don't know. This is a two. 
this would also be a 2, this would also be a 2. And here the main difference is that we have to go from the center of mass of body 2 to contact point of body 2. And instead of experiencing P, we're experiencing the torque because of minus P. Right? But again, we can write this down for body 1 and body 2. And this is almost everything we have. We have two more things that we need. The first one is our coefficient of restitution E, which is defined in a very analogous fashion to what we did uh, for particles. And what we see here is that the relative separation velocity of the two particles. So what we need is the velocity of these two contact points as after collision divided by before the collision. So for example, you could take the velocity of S2 after the collision minus the velocity of S1 after the collision. And we divide this by exactly the same, V of S2, but now before the collision, minus V of S1 before the collision. And this is nothing else but the relative approaching or separation velocity of the two particles. This is the relative velocity at which the two particles separate. And this down here is the relative velocity at which the two particles come together. I'm missing one thing because these must be the normal components. This is just like for the case of particles. What we do is we define two different directions. The one being, oops, the normal direction, En. The other one being the tangential direction, Et. Right? Otherwise it's the same as the particles. Now that we have this, we need one final last thing, and this is uh, what closes the problem. And here we have to make an assumption. If it is a smooth, frictionless surface, then it's the same as for particles. We know that there's no transverse force being transmitted, which means nothing else but the linear momentum of each of the particles afterwards, or specifically their velocities, must remain unchanged. And so what this means is the velocity of any of the particles, let's say 1 in the tangential direction, t plus, equals the same as the velocity of that body before the collision. And again, you can write the same down for body number 2. Now, if we do have friction, and this is the case whenever we have a rough surface, and there's one exercise this week, we have a rough goalpost, then the situation is a tiny bit different because in this case, they can transmit forces also in a tangential direction. But if they are rough, then we assume that the two particles stick to each other during the collision. And what that means is they may be coming in with different velocities, but the moment when they leave, they must have the same velocity in the tangential direction at this point, because these points cannot slide on each other. They must be in touch and they must be in contact, so they're sticking to each other. It's like half the hagum at that point. It's static friction, and they cannot separate. But that means is that the velocity of particle 1 in the tangential direction afterwards is the same as the velocity of particle 2 in the tangential direction afterwards. And now please note an important point. This is not exactly true because what point are we talking about? We're talking about these points S1 and S2 where the bodies are separating. Now please note that in the lecture notes I made a stupid typo. I didn't write S1 and S2, I wrote CM1 and CM2. I had luckily seen this before class today, and I fixed it on Moodle, but not everyone has seen this yet, and I must admit I also forget to mention. So, when this comes up in the exercises, this should be S1 and S2, right? Because these two points are sticking to each other. It's not the centers of mass which are sticking to each other. So forget about the centers of mass here. I have updated the lecture notes on Moodle. If you check out the latest version, you will see that it's no longer centers of mass there, but it's actually the points S1 and S2. And that's everything we need to know for rigid bodies moving and colliding. Now, because there are two parts to week number seven, I also want to briefly talk about rotations. This is the second topic that we covered in class this week. And this is the topic, oops, you can't read that. This is the topic that occupies us for a little bit in the second half of the exercises. And what we want to do here is some very simple math. We don't even want to, to consider mechanics yet, but it's just a mathematical exercise. So think about this. Let's say we have a coordinate system, E1 and E2. Now this is our Cartesian coordinate system. I usually refer to this as E1 calligraphic C and E2 calligraphic C. And let's say that I have a vector V inside this coordinate system. Right? 
Now, what I could do is I could come up with a second coordinate system, which is different. For example, I could have my E1 here and my E2 here, which is obtained from the, from the original one by a rotation. And instead of calligraphic M, I'm going to call a uh, calligraphic C, I'm going to call this calligraphic M. Right? So now I have a C frame and an M frame. They share the same origin, which is down here, but they have different basis vectors. And now what we call a passive rotation is exactly this. A passive rotation means the vector v that we care about stays exactly the same vector. It has the same magnitude, it points in the same direction. We're just rotating the basis in which we want to evaluate the components of the vector. Because a vector is independent of the chosen basis. The vector just points in the direction and has a certain magnitude. Its components depend on the basis in which we want to evaluate those. And so in particular, if you want to evaluate its components in this vector, in this basis here, what you would do is project it onto the axis, and then we would you know, read this on here as the component in the one direction of this vector in the C frame, and we use this notation to indicate components in a particular frame. And this distance from here to here would be the component in the two direction of this vector in the C frame. But then, of course, if you project it onto the different frame, right here, oops, you would have different components. And so the components change if you undergo passive rotation of the coordinate system. And in particular, what we showed in class is that if you take the components and you want, for example, the ones in the M frame, then these are related to the components in the C frame through a rotation matrix. And here we introduce J equals 1, 2, 3. And here we need the components of this rotation matrix, T, I, J, which is the one that takes us from C to M. That's what this notation signifies. And then here we have the components. We don't need the underscore here, I guess. Bj and the C frame. So what this means is if you know these components in the C frame and you want the ones in the M frame, what you have to do is take this rotation matrix in between and do this matrix times vector product and you get the new components. And the way to read the subscripts is that this one takes components in C and transfers them into M. So you read this backwards. You're going from C to M. And this thing, of course, we can also go the other way around. We've shown that this is nothing else but the inverse of going from M to C, and the inverse for rotation is the same as the transpose, and these can in fact be evaluated. This is nothing else but EJ in the C frame times EI in the M frame. So if we're in 2D, for example, it would be a two by two matrix, and all we have to do is dot these two C vectors into the two purple M vectors, and from this we get four numbers, and they populate the two by two matrix that we call the rotation matrix. And so now if you have a vector and you know its components in one frame and you know how the frame is being rotated, you can use this to calculate the rotation matrix and from that get the components in the new frame. That's what we call a passive rotation. Part two is what we call an active rotation. This is almost the same, but what we do here is we don't rotate the frame, we rotate the actual vector. So what we do here is, let's say, you keep your frame like this, E1C, this is E2C, and what I want to do now is I take this vector V and I apply an actual rotation to the vector, which means this thing is being rotated, and this new vector over here is, you know, it's a new vector, it's called this U, this is nothing else but R times V, but this R is a rotation tensor. And what we've seen is that this rotation of the vector is very similar to, of course, the rotation of the coordinate system, but this thingy, which describes the rotation, which in our case is Rij, let's say it's the one which goes from C to M. If you want to evaluate its components in the C frame, this is nothing else but Tij transpose. Oops, where this Tij is the one which goes, I'm sorry, from M to C. So what this means, simply put, is that if you rotate a frame like this, and in that case you change the components of the vector, or you rotate the vector, in both cases you can get the components of the new vector, either in the new frame, or of the rotated vector in the same or the new frame, by a rotation of this type or of this type. It's always the new equals R times the old. 
And these two are related to each other and they're in fact the transpose. And this kind of makes sense because if you rotate the coordinate axis, then if you look at it, the vector is getting closer to your coordinate axis. So here, the angle from your axis to the vector gets smaller. Your vector rotated towards the new basis. In this case, it's the exact opposite. So here, your vector is rotating away from the original basis. And if here, you're rotating your coordinate frame by some angle, let's call it phi, your vector is rotating towards the frame with phi, whereas here it's rotating away from the frame with, with phi. And that's why we have these opposite rotations here. Here we're rotating one way, and here we're rotating the other way. Because for rotations, the transpose and the inverse are exactly the same. For any rotation, the transpose is the same as the inverse. And these are the two that we have appearing here. Now the last thing you should know for rotations is that we can also have what we call a composition. It means nothing else but applying multiple rotations to the same vector. So for example, if you take that vector and you rotate it first this, then out of plane, then something else, then yet another one, you can do as many rotations as you wish. What comes out is that. You take V and you apply a rotation one. This gives you a new vector, right? If you now want to apply a new rotation, you have to take this vector and apply a new rotation. If you then want to apply a new rotation, you apply yet another rotation. And you keep doing this as many, I'm sorry, this is a two. You do this as many times as you wish. This is Rn. And then finally, this will be the new vector. So the key point is that if you want to rotate a vector, you can multiply rotation matrices, but you do it in reverse order, because this is the one that acts on V first, then this acts on this combined vector, this acts on this combined vector, and so forth. And because we can remove the parentheses by classical matrix vector operations, the total rotation is nothing else but the product of all of these rotations, but in backward order. And that's essentially anything we need to know for active and passive rotations for this week, and the rest will come next week. Thanks, and ciao.